Today is Tuesday, May 6, 2014. Um, I'm interviewing Jeff Clark, who served in the United States Navy. Uh, my name is Mark Barnes, and with me working the camera is Kendra Hazen. Uh, we're interviewing Mr. Clark as part of the UCF Community Veterans History Project and his research for the creation of the educational wall for the Lone Sailor Memorial. We are conducting this interview in Maitland, Florida. Um, Mr. Clark, uh, will you please just begin by telling us um, your name, where you're born, when and where you're born? Sure. My name is uh, Jeffrey Clark, and uh, I am originally from East Hartford, Connecticut. I was born in Hartford, Connecticut on January 31st, 1968. And um, in 1983, my family moved to Florida to Flagler County in Palm Coast where I attended Flagler Palm Coast High School. Um, and then I did drop out of high school at the age of 17 and joined the Navy shortly after my 17th birthday where I went through the Orlando Naval Training Center here. Upon completion of my uh, active duty, I returned to, uh, I did obtain my GED while I was in the Navy. And then upon completion of my active duty, I did graduate from DBCC, Daytona Beach Community College and then transferred and graduated um, at UCF majoring in economics and minoring in political science. Uh, do you have any brothers, sisters, parents you want to tell us about? Or? Sure. I have um, two sisters, and um, both of them still reside here in Flagler County in Florida. And then my parents are, are still alive and live in Flagler County as well. My father, I come from a, a, a military family, um, sort of on the... In the Forrest Gump movie, I believe, where the uh, Lieutenant Dan had a, an ancestor that had fought in every major American war back to the colonial period, and I have that same uh, line lineage as well, and it goes back to the Mayflower on my father's side. Um, my father served in the Navy and went through Bainbridge, Maryland for his boot camp, and then uh, was, uh, was aboard an aircraft carrier, the USS Chihuahua, the CB-40, and my grandfather, his father, served in World War II. He was in the Army and stationed in the Philippines. And then on my mother's side, my, uh, my mother is also from, and both my father and my mother are from Connecticut as well. And uh, my mother's side of the family, they were Italian immigrants. Um, my grandfather immigrated um, in the 19, well, both my grandparents immigrated from Italy to the U.S. in the 1920s. And then uh, when they were younger, obviously, and then my, my mother was born in 1945, my father was born in 1939. And did you join the Navy for any particular reason? Actually, I have a bit of an interesting story in that. One time when I was around eight or nine years old, I filled out this application to inquire about the Navy out of a magazine or something like that. And obviously, you could tell that a, that a child wrote it. Well, my father took it as a joke and mailed it in. And I always wanted to join the Navy for, I don't know, you know, so I enjoyed history and my father was in the Navy. So my father mailed this application for me to send information about joining the Navy and I received this letter from a captain in the Navy that said you know sorry to you know but you know you're too young and he, and he gave me a couple posters and some other items to say here's some stuff to help you keep thinking Navy and when you're old enough you know please come back well pretty much came back at the at the minimum age possible and uh, you know I always wanted to join the Navy when, from when I was a child you know, the, I think it was that TV commercial, you know, it's not just a job, it's an adventure. So it was Navy or bust for you? Huh? Pretty much, yeah. So, um, you said you attended boot camp in, uh, in Orlando? In Orlando at the yeah. Naval Training Center. Uh, was that by choice or did they just tell you where to go? Or? Um, I like to think it was by choice because when I joined it was February and having lived in Florida and being accustomed to the warm weather I told the recruiter that I would go into the Navy now if I could go to Orlando or San Diego in not Great Lakes because there were three facilities for boot camp in the Navy Great Lakes San Diego and Orlando at that time and, and I remember my father was very anxious he said well you're gonna go in now you know take them but uh, somehow luck I would presume um, I went through Orlando uh, and we'll, we'll come back to this, but what, what were you trained to do in the Navy? What was your job? Um, what were your jobs? Initially when I went in, I was a basic seaman recruit to do basic shipboard um, 
tasks such as you know chip and paint and painting and um, in the boats in Mayfield, you know, sort of basic deck, deck board duties. However, um, during the course of the time, I did become a signalman, which was communications and navigation primarily with uh, Morse code via the flashing light semaphore um, as well. And the flags. And, and in that A school, by the way, it, if I had entered the Navy as a signalman instead of a basic senior recruit, the training for the signalman school was here in Orlando as well at the Naval Training Center. Okay. Um, well, we're going to circle back through your life as a recruit, and okay. then we'll circle back through your life as a, as a sailor. Okay. Um, so when you first got to uh, your first day off the bus, so to speak, you know, what were some of the biggest adjustments you had to make? Going All right. I'm going to take a step back from from the bus, open it at the Orlando Naval Training Center, and since we're in the state of Florida, I'll keep us in the state of Florida. So. So when you enter the military, you go to your recruiting office and you complete all that, and they, I presume, do the background checks, similar, probably similar to any new employment process if you're hiring somebody. So one of the key things after you go through that, you have to go through what they call the MEPS Center, Military Entrance Processing Facility. And that was in Jacksonville. And up there you get an initial physical and they determine if you're kind of, the final step, if you're just worthy enough to to go on active duty. So I went through that in Jacksonville, and I remember going through there, and for some reason I had thought that I was not going to enter the Navy until the summertime. And this one Naval chief overheard me say that, and he said, what did you say? And I said, I, I'm, not, I'm not going on active duty until the summer. I said, I, I get to go home you know, after I go through the MEPS process today. And he said, oh no, you're not. You're going in tomorrow morning. And I'm going to personally see to it. I guess I was talking out of you know, the line. So, so, so anyways, I, we rode a bus from Jacksonville. And I remember I had to call my parents and say, I'm not coming home. <laughs> and it was kind of sudden and quick. So, I, and so we rode a bus from Jacksonville. And of course, we didn't even take 95 and 4. It was like going on a, on a Greyhound. And I think it took about five hours to get there because you know, we went down you know, 17 and then through Palatka and all the, and all the back roads through there to get to Orlando. So we made it there, and they, and they dropped us off at, at the bus, at the, at the bus area, and then you kind of get indoctrinated where you come in and you start to initially. So the initial shock was like, wow, this is for real. But you still had your civilian clothes and you still had your hair. And so then that way, you, and then you, you got your assignment of you know where your, what your company you were gonna be assigned and what building at the Orlando Naval Training Center would be your home for the, for the course of boot camp. And then the next day was kind of, you know, the first couple of days were kind of entry, you know, kind of getting indoctrinated and, you know, you go through another health screen, you go through, you get your haircut and you get your clothes and all that assigned. Then you begin the actual boot camp process. Do you have anything that stands out from your time? Oh, there? yes, yeah, <laughs> definitely. Uh, so, so, for example, and, and at this time, I obviously had more hair than I do now, but, uh, I was very proud of my hair, and, you know, pretty boy, as they would say in the Navy, and uh, when I got my head shaved, I didn't look at myself in the mirror for about five or six weeks. I never I would feel it, it would be like, oh. And luckily they didn't have mirrors or anything in the boot camp uh, birthing area, you know, the living area. So, and, and I made a purpose not to look at myself. That was the biggest, the biggest shock. The, the other shock that I had was, I was gonna have to learn how to fold clothes because you know, kind of like out of a movie where, you know, you know, my mommy, as they would say, you know, washed, folded, and put my clothes away for me, but that changed, and I had to learn how to fold clothes. And, but I was a baseball player in high school, and I was very physically active, so the physical, you know, nature of boot camp that everybody thinks of all the physical activity was really not, a, not an issue for me. I was already in pretty good shape from you know, playing baseball and other physical activity. Did, uh, did you have any memories when you graduated? Did your folks come back? Yes. Um, as part of the process, there was a graduation ceremony, and my my family, including my father's parents, my grandparents, came came down and, uh, and and we went to the they went to the graduation ceremony, and they were able to get a tour of the facility, and and they did, and it's like a parade ground, and they would set up 
these uh, you know bench area bleachers, and the families were able to watch us do our pass and review and and, and hear the speeches from the from Captain Nice, who was the um, recruit training center commanding officer, and uh, and see us conduct our, our ceremony. And then afterwards, um, you know everybody went home, but you know we were able to meet up, and you know, it was good to you know, for my parent, for my family to, to be there to see that. And that was a, you know. The equivalent of like a high school graduation, I would say, very similar, but you know, dressed in military and military ceremony. Um, when you graduated from boot camp, what was your next assignment? Sure. Um, upon graduating boot camp, um, boot camp lasted about eight and a half weeks. Um, I actually entered active duty on February 26, 1985, and then boot camp officially started March 1st. And as I mentioned, those first couple days were you know, getting your hair cut and getting your clothes and getting indoctrinated. And then when I graduated, um, I started in, I continued at, at the Orlando Naval Training Center. They did have additional training um, schools there. The one I went to is when I entered the Navy, I entered the apprenticeship training program and that was open to individuals who wanted to focus on more of a general, kind of like a liberal arts, if you want to call it that, to compare it to, to college. So there was a seaman apprenticeship, a fireman apprenticeship, and an, and an air apprenticeship. And then once you completed that training, then you would get assigned to, to a permanent duty station. So seamen went into, you know, were eligible and, and, and did a cross range of duties, such as um, in the boat, boatsman mate field, which is the deck duty. And then airmen, you know, went and supported, you know, aircraft either on carriers or as part of a detachment. And firemen kind of could, could go on ships because they were the ones who worked down in what we called the pit, the boiler room and the, and the engine rooms where the boiler technician rates and the machinist mates um, ran that. And so I, I, I went through the seaman apprenticeship training program. Um, were there certain classes you had to take or do you know about the classes for the various, for the three places, you just the three schools you just described? Yes. Um, so basically how the Orlando Naval Training Center was set up is is you kind of had, there was, if I remember right, I think there were 10 buildings, 10 or 12 buildings, and, and, and it was set up very, you know, military style. On, on one end, you had sort of the, and, and, and they were called, I forget what they were called, but there was like building one, building two, et cetera. So on each end was kind of like the administrative offices. And then in between and in sequential order on each side, I think there was 12, there was two on the end and five, five this way, and five that way. And and then on one side, and then in the middle there was a divider, like a road that went through the middle. And on one side was strictly where boot camp was conducted, and on the other side is where the schools were conducted. And they were the living quarters, basically, or birthing areas as they're called in the Navy. And so I went through the seaman apprenticeship training. It was a series of classroom training and on the job training. They did have the USS Blue Jacket that was there, which was a training you know, on you know, simulation of a ship. And so we would go perform for seaman apprenticeship training, you know, how to tie knots, how to tie up a ship, how to raise flags, and other things associated with the seaman apprenticeship. And then the firemen did similar things where, you know, they went in and simulated what jobs they would do once they went to the fleet. And that apprenticeship training was, was approximately four weeks for that. Now, how would you describe the relationship between your instructors on that side versus your instructors on the sure. recruit side. On the recruit side, the boot camp, you know, was very strict, very boot camp, very structured, um, you know, very military, you know, very military, you know, controlling is, you know, I guess would be a way to describe it. You know, your day was fully planned. You, you know, you, we woke up at 4 a.m. We went, you know, we, we you know, we, we did some initial drills and then we had our set breakfast time. You know, Company 101's breakfast was from say 5 to 5.30. You came back, you washed up, you know, brushed your teeth, whatever. Then you, then you had a set criteria of every day what you would do. And most of it was practicing marching for your graduation ceremony as well as other, um, you know, stuff that was, you know, boot camp related, you know, um, physical activity, swimming, um, firefighting drills, that everybody needs to know for the military and, and, and other basic stuff. Now this was a little bit more specialized and it was a, like I said classroom and 
on the job training. And I would say that and there was a bit more freedom. It, it was like a, a nine to five job. You know, you woke up, you started class at eight o'clock, you had lunch from 12 to one, and you were free to go do what you want. In addition, I guess the big thing was, you were free on the weekends to go do whatever you wanted. Whereas in boot camp, you, know, you were in boot camp and you were not allowed to leave. The only time that we left boot camp is after six weeks, you were granted what they call a restricted liberty where it was kind of like a an elementary school field trip, you know, like the SeaWorld or, or Disney or somewhere like that. And it was very restricted and, you know, you, you know, it was governed. Then you had an unrestricted liberty, like the week before you graduated, and that's where you could stay within the city of Orlando and kind of go anywhere you want. You had to be back at a certain time. And, and I guess the story for this would be everybody, you know, all the instructors and the, the officers would say, South OBT is off limits because it's kind of a dodgy area. But of course, where does everybody go? South OBT. So that's pretty much where un unrestricted liberty went. <clears throat> and then, like I said, during the apprenticeship training, you, know, you were free to do on the weekend. So I, and then um, I used to go home, and you know, my, my mother would come pick me up, or my father would come pick me up, and I'd visit my friends on the weekend. And then I had to be back Monday morning by 8 o'clock to go to class, so it didn't really matter. But I usually come back Sunday night because we were still living in our living quarters. I guess the way to compare it, you know, is boot camp was kind of like, you know, elementary school and high school, very structured, very strict, you know, limit, limited, and, and apprenticeship training was more like, you know, college where, you know, hey, this is what you got to do is, you know, here's your times, the rest of that's up to you. Now you had, when you said you were living there, did you guys have apartments almost when you were an apprentice? Um, no, it was very, it was the same as um, uh, what we had in boot camp you know, the same structure. So basically it was an open area, like a barracks, and it was for en enlisted. Now officers tended to have the equivalent of more like a, more like in a, you know, hotel or a, or a small apartment, and they would usually share that with one other officer dependent on their rank, but general enlisted. And this even continued into the Navy with various living quarters on ships, whether you were enlisted or if you were a chief, which was a senior enlisted person, kind of like middle management, or if you were an officer different living quarters. So it was an open area and it had bunk beds and lockers for you to store your stuff. And it was the same as in UK. Now outside of the schools, the training schools, the command schools that you went to, do you have any recollection of the other schools that maybe were offered at the base? Um, yes. From what I recall, because um, as I went, during my time in the Navy, I, I went on and, and they call it striking out. I don't know why they call it that because it's actually a win, you know. But basically, you get to, to move on from sort of a general um, you know, seaman apprenticeship type role to a more specialized one. And I became a signalman, which was the shipboard flags, communications and navigation, as well as communications with uh, flashing light via Morse code and semaphore. And the signalman school was here in Orlando. And also, and then, so basically, the, the school structure was as follows. You had the, the generalist, the apprenticeship training program that I talked about that I went through. Then you had A schools, which was schools that were for for a specific job in the Navy, whether you were a storekeeper, a signalman, or you know something like that. Then there were also C schools, and C schools were for very specialized skills, which normally required an extended enlistment period, such as six years active duty. And so during that time, people were kind of classified based upon what their enlistment was that they signed up for. There were the um, three by sixes, which meant you were three years active and then six years of um, inactive reserves, or IRR, right? Inactive readiness reserves, I believe is the, the military term. There were four by fours, and I was a four by four, which meant four years active, four years inactive. And then there were the um, six by twos, which was the specialty folks who went to extended training. They were six years active and then two years in active reserves. Unless, of course, if they re-enlisted on active duty, then they would continue. And the key thing about C school is that once you completed about a two-year classroom on the job training program, you, be, you automatically became an E4, a petty officer third class. And we used to call those people boot camp thirds. Because like I had to go through, you know, to be an E1, an E2, an E3, and then in E4, whereas these guys automatically got, you know, yeah, you know, got credits basically like, you know, college, you know, you got some free credits. And so there were some C schools here, including the nuclear, the nuclear program, 
was here, and the Signalman School was here, and I think, no, the Storekeeper School was in Mississippi, that wasn't here. But, uh, but from what I remember, the apprenticeship training, Signalman, and there was like fire control tech technicians, radar, radar schools. Um, any other, um, anything else unique about, there was maybe off of the base, some special to the base that, that just happened? I guess, you know, just kind of life on the base. There was the Navy exchange, so if you were a retired Naval person in Florida, accumulated a lot, you know, a lot of retirees and a lot of military retirees because of the history with Sanford and in Orlando, so the Navy exchange store was there so you know if you were active duty or if you were a retired military you could do your shopping in certain cases get things a lot cheaper than you know out in the you know, regular market um, other than that it was pretty much for I remember just the training facility and I remember there was a high school on the right on the outside of the base because we had you know, it seemed like sometimes we would joke we were kind of in prison you know and you could see the you know freedom on the other side I remember you know like we would be out marching on the grinder and doing all these drills, and you look over and you see these high school kids, you know, running track and field or, you know, some event at the high school, and, you know, you're thinking we're in prison, but. Um, so when you left Orlando, uh, you boarded a ship? Yes. Um, upon completion of my apprenticeship training course, a little bit more of a story here is uh, I, had a, I had a chief petty officer, and I forget his name, but uh, we, you received your orders where you went to go, and so where, and I was always kind of joking around a little bit with the with the chief, and sure enough, where I get stationed, but on the same ship that he had come from to the Orlando Naval Training Center from. So I remember he told me that it was going to be tough, and he was going to, and that he arranged to have me go to the USS Richard E. Byrd, TDG 23, guided missile destroyer, home ported out of Norfolk, Virginia, and and that's where I went. And interesting enough, this chief I then met years later when I was attending UCF and I was working in, at Nations Bank, now Bank of America, and he was a customer there and I remembered him and he came in and we chatted and caught up and uh, he was living out by UCF at the time and he was a customer of the bank. But uh, I, I, I caught my ship and I remember it was in the middle of a deployment towards the tail end of a North Atlantic NATO cruise and I remember I had, I received my orders and I had to go there and I had all my airplane tickets, they arranged all that. And I looked down there and I'm like, where is this place called Ponta Delgada? And there was no internet in 1985, so I had to go look in the encyclopedia. And it was in the Azores Islands, Portuguese islands in the, in the Atlantic Ocean. So I remember I flew from Orlando to, to New York and then caught Air Portugal to Lisbon and had a couple night stay in Lisbon overnight and then caught the flight to Ponta Delgado where I caught my ship. And I still remember the, the, the first people I met who I'm still in contact with today um, on board my ship. Um, Gary Hang and Kirk Keesgan and Alan Welch in particular because I was assigned to deck division and I was assigned to them and and, uh, and then, then from there you know I was assigned to the ship and that became my permanent duty station that I stayed at for the remainder of my term, three years and eight months. Um, so you left the Navy when? In, in February 89, after February. four years active duty and then served uh, in the inactive reserves, which just meant if there was call up, you know, you were subject. So uh, what, did you, what did you end up doing when you left the Navy? Okay, what, when I left the Navy, um, I uh, started attending Daytona Beach Community College, which I think is now Daytona State College or something. And, and, and so, and I stayed in Flagler County and I just did kind of odd jobs. I worked in a warehouse primarily while I went to DBCC and then I started uh, working in the bank as a bank teller, then a sales and service rep. And that actually worked out well because at the time, the, with the state, you could complete your first two years at a community college and then automatically transfer into any of the Florida state university system campuses. So I transferred to Orlando and because I worked at the bank, it was you know, quite an easy transfer to, to move over. So I, I started UCF in the fall of 93 after graduating from DBCC in spring of 93 and then I graduated in, in spring of uh, 95 from UCF. And, I, and also, I guess, during the Navy, some other good, good things when I became a basic seaman apprenticeship and I, and I was assigned to the deck division on board, besides just chip and paint and doing all the, the deck stuff, 
the favorite thing, and I, and I still remember it today, and, and it was one of my favorite things is, you know, I was barely had my driver's license, but at age 17, I qualified as a helmsman, and I drove the ship. I was at the wheel, and I qualified to run the ship's engines, the Lee Helm, and I used to stand lookout watch. So here I was, 17 years old, and I actually saw a video on YouTube, like a, a Navy video, and it shows like this 22-year-old guy who says, yeah, this is my job, and it's the same thing, and I still remember to this day how to take the helm. You would, you, you would go up, if you were to take the helm, let's just say you're at the wheel right now, I would walk up to the, I would first come to you and say, hey, what's the coordinates? What are you steering? What are you checking? That's sort of the, the numbers of the, you know, from the compass of where you, what direction you were going. And I'd collect that, I'd go check how much, what the speed was in knots, and then I would go up to the officer of the deck, he would go up and salute, and he'd say, officer of the deck, request permission to take the helm. Steering course, 225, checking 222, starboard unit, starboard cable, all engines ahead standard, 17 knots in a K and answer for it. And the officer deck would reply back and say, relieve the helm. And then he would go over and then I would, I would take over. Yeah, that's, a, that's cool. Well, I was getting ready to ask you, what was your, some uh, of your favorite memories of the, uh, okay, of the right, That's I a great one. Do you, have a, do you have another one there? That, oh, uh, yeah. There's plenty. You know, and then really anything you tend to do in, you know, in, in your life, it's really about the people. And, you know, made some great friends, still in contact with a lot of them today. And lessons learned. You know, I was a young kid, um, you know, 17 to 21 while I was in the Navy. And, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of memories, you know, of, you know, Growing up, doing stuff, and I guess another thing is, I was I was always kind of a, a prankster a little bit, and I was getting ready, to, and I used to come home on leave for spring break so I could meet up all my friends and we go to Daytona and all that. So one time I went off base and I got a, and, and the senior chief, senior chief Moses, who was in charge of deck division, who I worked for, his his plan was, you know, you had to look like a sailor. He was very strict with inspections. So well, one time I was trying to sneak and I went off base and I got what he would call a pretty boy haircut. So came back and sure enough, someone told on me and he personally walked me down to the ship's barber and butchered me or whatever. And so as a retaliatory, I decided next day, I'm gonna go put some red moose in my hair and go stand inspection in front of him. Big mistake. <laughs> I remember he walked up to me, put his face in my face, and he goes, take your hat off, punk. And he was this Texas Texan guy, big Texan guy. And I took it off, and I was smiling. I wasn't smiling much after that. He told me I had exactly two seconds to wash that expletive out of my hair, or he was going to personally shave my head. Let's just say I jumped down the forward hatch and had that stuff out pretty quickly. <laughs> um. And this kind of ties into to this whole project that we're doing, and, and you mentioned it. But um, you made a lot of personal friends. You're still in yep. contact with them. Yep. And yeah. Out on you know out on Facebook, but all, and on Facebook we have our ships. Uh, we have a, a page of our ship, okay. and so a lot of us connected through there. But even before that, there was like a newsletter and there and some reunions that go. Because I was on an older ship that was commissioned in the early '60s, and then decommissioned shortly after I left in, in 1990. So you know, there's you know, there's you know, there's 30 years of history pretty much with my ship that I was on. So the reunions, you know, you have a, a you know 30 years of people who served on board. So it, it, it's quite large and, and extensive. And then I always try to make the effort to visit some of the folks. I travel ex extensively for my current job. And if I go to a city where one of those guys are, you know, we always try to, to meet up. And, and, and a lot of them are kind of joking when you know. I, first got connected with him, say, on Facebook, and they say, I can't believe you're this corporate guy in a suit. You're the last guy, you know, we would have thought as a corporate guy in a suit. Um, is this your first trip? You've been back to Orlando since. Oh, you oh yeah, and actually, um, I guess after I finished the Navy, I graduated from UCF and then uh, worked locally in Altamont at the Kirchman Corporation, which was a banking software company, and then I worked for Pro Systems in Maitland, mm -hmm. and then I went to uh, on an assignment to Luxembourg in Europe. Was there for a couple of years, and then I then I came back and I was on a project in San Francisco, and then and then this was 2001. So basically, the time scale goes, you know, from you know, exited active duty in '89, college until '95, Kirchman Corporation in Peru, '96, '97, Luxembourg, and. Uh, 
from 98 to 2001, and then San Francisco for about a half a year, and then and then, then I came back to Maitland, was working in Maitland, and lived in uh, Apopka from from 2001 till till 2005, where I moved to Atlanta, and I've been in Atlanta since 2005. What do you think about all the changes of the area that used to be the base? You know, it's kind of somewhat sad. There's really nothing left there. It, it, and Carla Novak, who's a personal friend of mine from when from UCF days, uh, gave me a tour and around the Lone Sailor um, Foundation and the plans for that. And she showed me where the statue was going to be and. And you know we're kind of, and both her and I went through there. So we were thinking, this is. And she says, well, this is the old grinder. And she was saying, remember we'd go over here and have to do these drills. Well, now it's this open grass area, or or over there is the housing, you know, where our birthing area was. But now there's, you know, Baldwin Park is there. So it's somewhat sad to think that. And it, and, it, and I'm kind of one that I like to preserve history. I wouldn't want to say you'd have to preserve the base as is, but you know, I think how important and how many lives, you know, went. You know, you know, were shaped by, you know, such as mine, going through boot camp, you know, going from being a kid to an adult, basically, you know, that there's really not much left there. What do you think the legacy of the base is? I would say the legacy of the base I, is going to be, you know, the individual experience of the people that really went through there. I mean, there's not much left to see of, you know, what was what was left there, what was done. It was, you know, a, a training facility, classroom, and on-the-job training, basically, so it's you know, so there's not much left as far as you know what you think of the Navy of you know ships or aircraft or weapons or anything like that. But I really think it's about personal experience, and, and everybody had a you know had a different experience uh, you know that they went through there. Well, and as a returning sailor, um, what what would you want to see if you returned back to to the area to see the memorial? I mean, what, what would resonate with you? I think some. Some pictures, um, you know, of the of the facility itself. You know, you know, you know, kind of like if you went into a museum, you like to see this was, you know, our Orlando Naval Training Center was here from 1968 till 1992 or something like that. And here's pictures and you know, kind of what you know, like from my um, boot camp book. You know, went there. You know, there's pictures in there that, that show the activities and kind of what went on there. And everything's changed. You know, from you know, boot camp's probably similar, but there's a lot of changes. You know, and and, and I think preserving the history and at least showing that while we can would be, you know, a good a good thing, you know, you know, to show there with the Lone Sailor. The Lone Sailor is a great thing to to reflect there. But I think, you know, any memorabilia or, you know, pictures that show it at, at one point in time, this is what was here and, and and quantify it. You know, X number of people went through during this time. Who were the commanding officers? You know, kind of like any, you know, similar you know, memorials or, you know, stuff like that. Um, that's about all I have. Is there anything that we missed that you'd like to add or a story you'd like to share? That we I think I pretty much covered everything. It was my time here in, in Orlando at the Naval Training Center from boot camp and then kind of post-activity. So I, I think we pretty much covered the full spectrum of, from, from, you know, from your questions there. So. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you. It. I'm glad to help.